Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Artistry Over Actor. My name is Javon Henry. I will be your host for this wonderful podcast. I've been a voice actor for the past, uh, uh, I'd say about eight years regularly, but three years full time. I've recently got a travel trail with my fiance and I'm traveling across the country, all the way out to the Northeast Southwest coast. And we are living our life, enjoying times, getting gigs, getting work, and hopefully working on big animation projects in the future. So Welcome to Artistry Over Actor. And today we're going to be going over a big concept, and that's the concept of how to set yourself up for success as an artist in order to make yourself successful as an actor. For today, once again, thank you guys so much for joining. And just a huge shout out to the amazing community that we have garnered for this channel. 500. We recently cracked 500 wonderful subscribers in this community. I just want to take a second and say thank you. Honestly, really and truly, thank you for for subscribing to the channel, for getting value out of it. I'm so glad that I can help all of you on your journey towards becoming a full-time, well-rounded artist. Not only actor, but musician, singer, artist, painter, whatever you're doing in your creative endeavors. I'm so glad that I could be the one to help facilitate a little bit of that change and to push you onto the next level in this step in your career. So it's absolutely amazing. 500, absolutely incredible. Thank you all for joining on this journey. And let's go ahead and jump right into this. So first things first, we're going to be talking today about Artistry over acting, how to actually feed yourself as an artist and uh, do what's right for you and you'll succeed. That's going to be one of the big overarching topics for today. You need to start by doing what's right for you, not by fitting into some type of box and compartmentalizing yourself and, and trying to niche all the way down so that you can be recognizable in a sea and an ocean of people. You need to do what's right for you, even if your path is different from the path of your hero, the people who you look up to, if different from the path of the people who they say will actually get you into the industry. You need to look and do your own path. Speaking of, let me make sure that, uh, to make sure that the audio is kicking. Yep. Okay. We seem to be good. So what is artistry? All right. That's where we're starting. Creative skill or ability. Artistry is defined as creative skill or ability. Now, this doesn't just have to come from acting. And this doesn't just have to come from one asset in life, right? Artistry comes from knowledge and understanding and practice to gain a skill. And the beautiful thing about artistry, why I say that this transitions into every stage in your career, is that artistry is more than just what you're doing. Right. So let's say you are a chef. You practice the skill of cooking. That takes great patience. Right. It great takes great understanding to know, OK, I need to balance the combination of sweet and salty in this dish. Right. You understand that you have to balance things out so that it's a nice, a nice even keel. Or, you know, that you want to push something a little bit more so that way you have a little bit of that taste. Transition right over to acting, where you read a script and you know, oh, I need to be funny but subdued on this, but I need to push that funniness a little bit more, just like when I'm cooking, right? The same as being a musician. Being a musician and flowing through your scores, understanding that it's not just about playing the notes, but it's about connecting to the audience emotionally and putting your energy into the music. It's the same thing. You can transition that over into acting. You can say, oh, I need to give this a little bit of push and I need to pull this line back just a little bit, right? Artistry is what the strive is because when you practice for artistry, you can hone all of those other skills and you can, not only can you hone them, but you can enhance them and you can stand apart from somebody who's just practicing one thing. So remember, artistry is what we are going for. Besides acting, what do you like to do creatively, right? We're not just one trick ponies. We are human beings and we like a variety of things. Do you like creative writing? Do you like animating? Do you like playing music? Do you like listening to music? Do you like cooking? Do you like traveling? Do you like, what do you like to do creatively? That's first and foremost. Grab a pencil, 
write in your notebook, write on your iPhone. What do you like to do creatively? What thing outside of acting or voice acting inspires you, gets you going, gets you motivated and gets you ready to move forward? That's where the first, that's where we need to start understanding what do you do creatively outside of simply acting. Now, here's a perfect example. I'm currently at the Grand Canyon, right? It's my first time ever being here. It's absolutely gorgeous. I look down while walking towards the edge. Don't worry, there were guardrails here. I look down while walking towards the edge. In three, two, one, I looked up and I will never forget my first viewing of the vastness of that canyon, the pastel colors, the, 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 to the bottom of the canyon. You can stack three Empire State Buildings on top of each other and it will just reach the tip. That's incredible. Just seeing this for the first time, it inspired a sense of wonder in me that I will remember for the rest of my life. And the beautiful thing is that sense of wonder can now be translated into other things. So let's say I want to make a dish that is full of umami and full of flavor and full of that wonder, I now have a frame of reference for when I taste it, when I try it, when I sample it throughout, does it instantly come from within? It is inspire. If I tell you, if I hold up this cup, I tell you not to look at this cup, your eyes are going to go to this cup, right? Your eyes are naturally going to go where I tell you not to go. Emotions in acting are kind of the same thing, right? If you try and tap into an emotion, if you say, I want to be angry for this scene, it is going to be extremely, exceedingly difficult to actually feel that emotion. Calling for an emotion is the easiest way to notice it, but to scare it away. Artistry does not come from within. It does not come from you saying, oh, I'm angry. I'm sad. I need to portray happiness. It comes from you taking something from without, from outside of yourself, and then implying that or putting that into your project. So taking those emotions, taking those memories, taking those situations, whether the situation is real or not, whether you um, subscribe to uh, Meisner or um, uh, Stella Adler, whatever actual method of acting you subscribe to. I'm not saying you need to take your uh, a Stanislavski approach and take it from inside and take an emotional center, although that's not what he really wanted at the end of his life. But I'm not saying you need an actual emotional center of your own. I'm saying you can create the situation. But knowing that creativity and artistry comes from outside of yourself and enhances your project that you're creating, that is pivotal to understanding how to move to the next level of your actual artistry. Okay. We're going to go ahead and talk about the rules, right? You need to know the rules in order to know how or that you can break them. In order to have permission to break them, you need to know what those rules, what those rules, really big now. Um, New York is the major hub for theater. All of these major hubs make it easier for you to get work. That's not to say that you need to be there to get work. But a lot of the time I hear that people say, make the rules, that you need to move to these major hubs in order to get jobs. Does that make it easier to get a job? Yes, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Do you need to move there to get a job? No, that's a bunch of BS. You can get a job online. You can get work online. You just need to forge your own connections with production studios, with casting directors. And um, we can make a whole video on how to do that because that's what I'm in, currently in the process of doing. But Know that working in a major hub is one of the rules that they say. If you hear that rule and don't know any different, it's not a rule that you need to live by. Number two, have certain pieces of equipment, right? A lot of the time, clients do like to hear that you're using a TLM 103, and they like to hear that you're using a UA um, uh, Universal Audio Apollo Twin, right? That's just what they like to hear. And it's what they like to hear because it's what they know. It's the names that they know. However, once again, I call BS on it. The reason why is at the end of the day, clients like to know what you're using so that they have a basis of knowing that you are professional, that you invested in your project. However, you can just let them know what you're using and give them a little bit of a background on it. So for example, I have a, I'm not going to pull that out. It's really big. I have a Telefunken 
T51. It's a tube microphone, sounds absolutely beautiful, and I use it for a lot of promo and commercial work when I need to have a deeper, darker, lower voice. And that's because it it warms up my voice with and it makes it just generally sound better for that type of work versus the TLM 103 is a solid state microphone. What does that mean? It means that it does not utilize any type of um, analog technology and it has a nice warm, but also bright. All you got to do is let them know, hey, this is the state of the art tube microphone. Uh, I use it for promo and for commercial because it sounds better on your project. Boom, bam, bizzle. Just let them know and be straightforward. The equipment thing is going to be a barrier of entry, but it does not need to be. As long as you are upfront and you explain what you're actually using, you explain why, you give reasons and you tell them, hey, this is professional top of the line grade gear. It'll sound perfect. Here are some samples of what I've done with it. You're not going to be restricted by the gear that you have. So don't fall for that rule. Number three. Record in a whisper room or some type of vocal booth. Now, this one is kind of important, but also no, it's also BS. So a whisper room is a state-of-the-art pre-built uh, vocal booth, right? They use um, uh, insulation, mass-loaded vinyl. They use um, OBS. They use double ply. They use a, a state-of-the-art. You go in there, and it's not only for sound isolation, but it also helps with a little bit of soundproofing. It is not soundproof, but it does help to cut out a lot of the extraneous noise that might come in. Now, saying that you have a whisper room is what a lot of people think that people want to hear, right? A lot of people get into voice acting and they believe that you need to have a soundproof room. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need anything near soundproof, right? I have my degree in audio engineering and I studied acousticians, uh, acoustic, acoustical engineering, you could say. It is damn near impossible, if not impossible, to have something that is soundproof. I'm talking you need like nine inches of dense material in order to have anything that is anything near soundproof. Nobody wants something that's soundproof or nobody needs soundproof. What you need is sound treatment, which is all this stuff around me. This is all sound treatment, right? I've got a carpet on the floor. I've got it also on the ceiling. And this way, sound dies in here. Right? There is no sound reflections in here whatsoever. This is the only thing that clients are looking for. And you can do this with your closet. You can do this with a blanket over your head and over the microphone. Like, There's been a big discourse on Twitter for some reason that it's disrespectful to record in a closet or that it's disrespectful to your craft to not record in a booth of some sort. And that is complete BS. I've worked projects with Disney, with Amazon, with Budweiser, with 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 Spotify, with the US government, with with Marvel, all in a closet. Like not not this, like a legitimate clothes closet. So, know that that rule is complete BS. If you see that anywhere on social media that you need to be recording in some state of the art whisper room or anything like that, just know that you don't. The reason why people do purchase that is for consistency. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Essentially, when you go into that room, it's going to be the same every single time. That's the reason why people get a whisper room, and that's the only reason why people get a whisper room. So if you go into a record uh, a room for a set, you get a whisper room. It's not for the optics, and it's not because it's necessary. It is an enhancement for your job because of the fact that it's the same sounding every single time. However, it's not necessary. I built this room into my travel trailer. And it works just fine. I've gotten plenty of professional AAA gigs in this trailer, in this vocal booth. So know that that rule is also BS. Now, last but not least, you need to look slash sound a certain way. This is the look is obviously for if you're on camera or doing mocap or anything. And the sound is for voice acting. And the reason why people say that is for marketability. So, for example, a lot of the voices that you hear... It's not like they want impressions, like clients want impressions. Some of them do. They want it to sound a certain way as in have a certain sound to it, have a certain tone or have a certain style for deliverability. So, for example, right now, um, let's look to the past a little bit so that we can get into this. It used to be that radio, radio announcers were very popular. Advertising an iPhone, an iPhone 13. Come and get it today. 
That's what clients are looking for. So when they say a certain type of tone, they don't mean impressionistic, but it is important for you to do research for the tone. Now, last but not least, look. Uh, this one is a little bit more of a gray area. I mean, the show business is very looks-based. It is very looks-based. Even today, that's okay. There are ways to get around it. There are ways to mitigate it. It's BS that you think that it's a rule that you can't make it because you look a certain way, right? Um, who's the kid on? Who is the kid on Stranger Things? Stranger Things um, cast. We are talking about Gatton, right? He plays Dustin, Dustin Henderson. He has, um, he has a, I don't want to call it a facial disorder because that's not the proper way to say that. Let me make sure I say this in a way. He has dysplasia, cleodocranial dysplasia. There we go. It um, basically allows him to unhook his jaw, right? Not the point. The point being that he thought that he wouldn't get any gigs because of this. The showrunners liked him so much, they wrote this into his character. Because there is still a path, regardless of who you are, what you look like, there is still a path in this industry for you. So understand that having to look a certain way, that rule, once again, is BS. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory of reality of life in California for me, right? This is different for everybody, but this is important so that you understand why you need to rent things before you commit to the purchase of buying them. And what I mean by that, if you save your whole life because you want to get out to California, so you save, you, 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 you start making connections, and then you get out to California and you realize you're absolutely miserable, well, then that was a waste versus if you just tried it out. If you go down, rent out a place, just give yourself a month. And then you realize not that it's hard, but whether or not you actually want to do it. Those are two completely different things. So understand that commitment needs to be when you're also in an emotionally good place. Now, let's give you a reality of the California life from my perspective. Number one, I couldn't be full-time in California. And this is the first time that this has ever happened in a very long time, right? I'm a full-time voice actor. My income comes from voice acting. But in California, I could not be full-time. That's because of gas prices. Uh, I mean, gas prices have a reason. Don't ever just be the person to be like, oh, gas is expensive in California. I mean, it is. It's like 60 cents per gallon for their environmental tax. And it takes a while to get shipped in because of the mountains in the way. There are a bunch of reasons why it's expensive, but that does not discount the fact that it's expensive. Um, uh, food is a little bit more expensive there. Uh, the life is a little bit more expensive there. It's the first time that I could not be full-time as a voice actor and have that be my only source of income right? That's, that's just the reality. It's rather expensive, depending on where you live. If you live close to the city where the actual work is, it's rather expensive. Number two, the scene is more competitive. That's a really good thing. It means that you have more work, right? It's a supply and demand. A lot of people go out to California because there's more supply, but that also means that the demand for those jobs are higher, right? There's a lot of skill concentrated in one area. Right? So you might feel like you need to stand out by doing something. You stand out by being yourself. Just be yourself. But just understand that there is more competition. Oh, that leads to number three perfectly. There's more opportunity for collaboration and connection. Because there's more competition, because there's more people concentrated in one area, it also means that you have more talent to collaborate with. It means that you have more people who want to do the same thing. You have more filmmakers, more animators, more voice actors who you can get together with, whether in person or online, because you're in the same area. Hell, meet at a coffee shop and just chat. You have more people to collaborate and connect with in Los Angeles or in the California area. That was something that was beautiful. Now, last but not least, traffic is a nightmare. Everybody says it. It is 100% true. I was in the San Diego area, right? In California, in the dead of night, or LA in the dead of night is like two hours away, right? Anything past like five o'clock hits, LA is now three and a half hours away, right? So just understand, you have to leave an hour, hour and a half early if you're not directly in the city to get anywhere. So just factor that in. 
understand that 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 is a part of life. You will be sitting in traffic, right? That's just a part of life. What can you do? This is one of the big overarching topics. Now, first of all, what can you do? You can go down to the description of this and find any of the free resources that I have. I got a whole bunch of free resources and those range from the best ways that you can read and write down a script. It ranges from a full-time voice acting guide and it ranges from a little book that I wrote in order to help you guys become full-time voice over artists. So go down in the description and uh, check out those free resources. That's one of the things that you can do. Other than that, Live your truth and make the damn cake. I'm so sick and tired of people saying I can't have my cake and eat it too. That's because you're waiting for somebody to make you a cake or you're trying to go out to the store and buy a cake. Make your own damn cake and that way you can eat it whenever the hell you want. Now, what do I mean by that? You need to be building in your own opportunities as an artist and as a voice actor. What does that mean? It might mean you make little skits and put it on YouTube. Put it on, on TikTok. Put it on Instagram Reels. It might mean that you practice scripts with yourself, with a voice recorder, and then you upload them. It might mean that you reach out to an animator and say, hey, I love your work. I just saw this. Uh, I saw that you put out something. I wanted to, for free, just put a voice to it. Hell, put a voice to it. Send it to them and ask them if it's okay for you to post it. If it's not, they will say that it's not. If it is, they'll say go for it. And that's a huge piece of portfolio work, number one. Number two, if they say that it's not, it's great practice for you. Absolutely amazing, right? You need to be going out and taking the opportunities instead of waiting for them to come for you. Just think about James Corden, right? Very controversial figure, but that's not the point. He started with the YouTube channel with a variety show getting his own, and that spawned him into getting bigger opportunities. And that's a lot. That's the same with a lot of your favorite actors, voiceover actors, animators, artists. They start making their own stuff, putting it out there, and then they get picked up, not just by the community, but they also get into the vision of those large studios, those large producers, those large brands. And that's how they get work. So stop waiting for somebody to serve you that cake and make your own damn cake. Stop thinking about all these rules and all these limitations and say, screw it, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to do what I love to do. Number two, hustle, collaborate, budget, decide. Projects, connecting with people, going to classes and workshops, going to conventions, figuring out the things that you need to do to take your life to the next step and meet the people who will help you get to the next stage. Number two, collaborate. You need to actually work with those people, not just say, oh, I want to do this for you, right? I want to work for you, but saying, I want to work with you. I'm your peer. I am someone who is in this journey together. I don't need you to pull me up. I want us to move forward together. Understand that collaborating is not the same as working for somebody. It's working with somebody to create something beautiful. So hustle, collaborate, budget. This is a business and you need to be saving your money and not spending it on dumb stuff, right? Dumb stuff is, of course, relative. I might love a huge cinema camera. Somebody else might think that that's dumb. It's relative. But understand that if you want to do this and want this to be a full-time lifestyle, you need to budget for it. Now, what does that mean? It could mean putting aside 50% of every gig that you get right? 25% of it for taxes, 25% of it for a rainy day. You got 50% of it left. 25 of that can go towards savings. And then 25% of that can be your last, uh, your spending bit, right? Just whatever budget works for you. Understand that this is still a freelance gig. So work might be long and in between in some stages. Like I've had some months where I three grand and some months where I make five pennies and somebody promised me to get, get, make me a sandwich. Like it's very difficult, impossible to tell how much work you'll actually be getting. So understand that you need to be budgeting for this lifestyle. And last but not least, decide, make a decision. You need to say whether or not you actually like this. Don't give up because it's hard. See whether or not you're actually committed to doing it, right? And that's the last part. Just make a decision. It's okay. If you don't like it, it's okay, right? This is your life. Don't just want to do it and want to like it and then end up hating it. Decide whether or not you want to. Now, don't put the cart before the horse, as they say, right? 
one step at a time. Do you need to move to a large hub? LA, Atlanta, London, Chicago, Tennessee, New York, Boston to some extent. Those are great places to be for work, for collaboration, for meeting people, for actually discussing and talking and chatting with people. However, that's not the first step of this process, right? That's a later stage. You need to start first by getting work, by making a portfolio, by figuring out who you even want to talk to and who you even want to work with. See if they're even in LA. They might be based in Texas. They might be based in Boston, in New York, in London, somewhere else. Figure out what you actually want to do. If you don't want to do animation and you don't want to do, I mean, some movie, I'm, they're still shooting movies in LA and TV shows and series. If you don't want to do something that's main, like let's go with New York, for example, right? If you don't want to do theater, why are you moving to New York? If you're predicating your move based on what you want to do in that main hub, right? If you want to do music, you probably should be going down to like Tennessee, right? So you need to be deciding what you actually want to do and predicate, predicate your life based on that. Decide if you want to be the action, be in the action, or make the action. Now, this one is rather important. This is something that I go back and forth about, right? Decide if you want to just be a voice actor and work with a studio or create a studio so that you can be a voice actor. The latter is a lot more work and a lot more lucrative. The former is still a lot of work, but um, it's easier for because you, you make a lot more money when you are up the, 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 the production design or the production set totem pole, as they would say. So you make a lot more money as a director than you do as an actor. I mean, it's just a fact. It's just a fact of life. Not because you necessarily, you know, I'm not even going to get into this can of worms. That is how it is. You make more money as the director than you do as an actor for a variety of reasons. Do I believe whether that is right or wrong? Not, not this topic of conversation. So a lot of people want to act, but they also know, well, I want to start making more of an income and be able to still act. So they decide, well, I want to direct slash act in this, or I want to be a producer in this, or I want to do something other than just be an actor. Understand. Hey, Flo, how you doing? Glad that you can join in. If you have any questions, just let me know. Um, understand that you need to decide whether you want to act or just own a piece of it while you are acting. Those are two different things, but they do make a big difference. And like I said, I'm in between that like every other day. Some days I just want to be a voice actor on a great project, right? I just want to act so I can have an impact. And other days I'm like, okay, screw this. I'm tired of all of this reaching out and connecting. I'm just going to build my own animation studio, build a project I want to act in, build a project that I can see myself in and that I can see other people enjoying and then act in that, right? The latter is a lot harder, a lot more time consuming, but could be a lot more lucrative. The former, obviously you get the ability to actually act. And actually Flo, are you a voice actor? Are you an actor, a musician? What do you, uh, what's your artistic medium? I'd love to know. And uh, last but not least, while Flo answers, feel, feed your artist, right? I've been traveling across the country for the last two and a half months. I've stopped in um, voice actor, great company. Um, I've stopped in, oh God, where have I stopped? New Mexico. I've been in uh, White Sands Desert, absolutely gorgeous. I've been in New Mexico. I was in uh, Arizona in the Phoenix area. I was in, um, was it Louisiana? Oklahoma. And then my last stop was, oh, Joshua Tree. And then my last stop was San Diego. San Diego was the lowest creatively and artistically that I felt like I didn't want to do any work in San Diego. It felt more like a vacation than it felt like I was in a beautiful area. So understand that you need to feed your artistic side in order to want to do this. And that can look different to everybody. It can look like going on a run, look like your location, going on a walk. It can look like, um, it can look like a variety of things. But understand, you need to feed your artistic side so that you can actually perform as a voice actor. I started as an actor, but I'm trying to do voice acting for now. Nice. That's a great place to be. I mean, you can voice act from, from anywhere. You don't have to worry about 
if you're in your pajamas, that's the stereotypical response. You can voice act from anywhere. You can do it from a booth. You don't necessarily have to go into a studio. It is a great, great transition. I don't know if you saw, but I have some resources in the description that you might want to check out. You can do that now or you can do that later. But they're like free resources for voice actors so that you can see uh, how I got into the industry. You can learn about different voice acting websites and how to navigate them and just uh, the equipment that you might need, just some odds and ends like that. So if you have any questions, just let me know. And also just, just make sure that uh, you check out uh, the description. I can't get my RMS slash peak to meet the ACX requirements. Okay. So ACX, that is very important to talk about. And that is a portion of something called mastering, right? There are two different disciplines or three, I guess you'd say editing, mixing, and mastering. Editing, basically chopping it up, make it to sound cohesive. Mixing, that's mostly if you have multiple things, you kind of mix them together so it sounds seamless. It sounds like it's all in either one location or they sound cohesive together. The EQ isn't overtaking one part, things like that. And then last but not least, mastering. Uh, mastering is what's going to get you to actually get to those ACX requirements. I've been following you for a while. Oh, thank you. Uh, mastering is what's actually going to get you to those ACX requirements. So I'm not sure what the peak requirements of ACX are at the moment, but what I am sure of is I have a mastering plugin that might do wonders for you. So let me make sure that I have mastering plug in. What you're looking for is loudness. Uh, let's see, there's Waves, Mastering Plugin, Abbey Road, um, Ozone Elements, Ozone 10. Uh, I'm going to get the name of this mastering suite. What I want you to do, Flo, is hit me up on my email. I'm going to put it in the chat at jtheva.com use audacity that's not a problem audacity should still be able to take this plugin i think audacity still works with yeah audacity still works with plugins um so hit me up at info at jtheva.com and what i'm going to do is i'm going to get you the name of that plugin and basically how i use it so it's essentially just a mastering plugin to make it so that you can meter up to meet certain requirements and the beautiful thing is in the plugin it'll actually have um presets for those requirements, which is what makes it absolutely amazing. So it'll have a YouTube preset and it'll tell you, you need to hit this peak. You need to hit this. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. I'd bring it up, but I think that it would be too much on my, you know what? Let me just bring that up in the background. Actually, I'll get you the name of it right now. Hopefully it doesn't do anything with this live stream. I don't think that it will. Um, but I'll get you the name of that when, um, while we're going right now and not a problem. If you have any more questions, just let me know. It's what I'm here for. All right. And last but not least, uh, I'm going to talk about some alternate paths um, so that you guys know that you don't have to just stay in one lane, right? And we're going to be talking about animation voice. You can look into it, right? The name is Waves Loudness Meter. Now, Waves loud Loudness Meter, it allows you to go to certain uh, preset. So like if I needed to upload this to YouTube, I can click on the YouTube preset and it'll tell me, uh, YouTube wants it to be this true peak, right? It wants it to peak out no higher than this, or it wants the range to be this, the long-term LUFS to be this. And you can actually just set your project based on whatever this is. Let me check and see if they have, uh, audible. So they don't have audible as a preset at the moment. However, you can set your own preset and load it in. So you can load in what you need the LUFS to be. You can load in what you need all of this stuff to be. And it will actually uh, track your metering and make it so that you know, okay, I just need to increase the gain here so that it right reaches this. Uh, yes. So it is a Waves plugin. All you need, just go on Google and uh, Google Waves loudness meter, and then it should come up. Let me make sure waves loud s meter yeah perfect waves wlm loudness meter and it will come up 
So yeah, that's pretty much what I use in order to do any of my mastering, just so I know where all the levels are and everything like that. All right, so let's just go over. This is the last thing that we have to talk about today. Uh, your alternative paths in the industry. If you feel like you are stuck. Animation deal. Work with an animator to build short projects. All you need to do is go on Instagram and search animation. Animator. Whether you do it on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook to a certain degree, it doesn't really matter. Just go on and search animator. And you're going to see a bunch of of animation projects. These can be cute little five second skits. These can be long detailed, huge drawn out fight scenes. Message them, message the ones who you actually want to work with and say, hey, saw your project, love your project. I'm a voice actor. I'd love to work with you, right? Or you can just take it, dub it and provide them with a sample. Say, this is what I've done with your work. I'd love to work with you further, right? Either way, you start to get some practice and you start to build a connection with an animator. Building connections with your peers will set you up for success because it is your peers who will become the next huge animator, right? So understand that you shouldn't necessarily just be aiming and shooting out for the people who are at the peak of their industry right now. You should be shooting out for your college roommate who's making small little animations who you see the potential in. That's who you should be collaborating and connecting with, right? One thing, uh, Flo, just make sure that um, before you go and spend any money, because I don't want you to spend any money and waste it, Audacity with plugins. Make sure that Audacity can work with Waves plugin. Ooh, and I got something for you. Here's a website that might solve your problems right now. Boop. One of the Audacity plugins that you can download for free or one of the plugins you can download for free is actually an Audacity check plugin. Boom. Um, now, uh, let's go back. Audiobooks. Read public domain stories. Reach out to small-time um, authors and public domain stories are going to be your best friend. Right? Just read them and upload them. Upload them to YouTube. Upload small snippets of you reading some potential voices to, to Instagram stories, to Reels, to, to TikTok. Understand that, no, it might not be like the booming niche. No, you might not get viral. But you'd rather have 100 people see it and one of those 100 people be an audio or an uh uh, an author who needs an audiobook narrated and loves your voice, read public domain stories and reach out to smaller authors and offer to voice over their book, narrate their book. Commercials. If you want to be a commercial voice actor, create spec ads. A spec ad is just a fake ad with a project, a product. So you, whether it be for Apple and you want to voice over it, whether it be for, um, a pro shampoo and you want to voice over it, just create spec projects. And once again, put them online. What you're trying to be. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. I am so glad. If you have any questions, Flo, just let me know. Just let me know. Um, feel free to email. My email is always open. My DMs are always open. I am here to help. Um, with uh, commercial, create that spec ad, right? And put that outline. That does two things. Number one, you might not know it, but 95% of the time, reaching out to a business and simply going, I would love to do a project with you. I'd love to voice over your project, right? They have so much crap, they're going to ignore it 90% of the time, unless you already have a bigger name behind yourself. If you create a spec ad and you post that and you simply tag them in it and you say, love your pro or love your products, they have something there that they can use. They can repost that. And that will be content for them. They hear what your voice sounds like and they'll know if it fits in with their brand. At the very least, they'll see that you've done something and that you've tagged them in something that you've created and you've already given them a little taste of what you can do, right? You've helped yourself by getting content and practicing. You've helped them by providing content, getting your name out there. Make spec ads. Spec ads are your best friend. Plus, it gives you a library of samples that you can provide. Anime. If you want to be in anime, you need to understand, A, it's rather difficult, small community, not a lot of work. A lot of it is in um, Texas, Flower Mound, and uh, uh, a lot of it 
for I'm not gonna I'm not saying prelay. There's a big difference. Prelay versus dubbing. Um, prelay is essentially just like uh, when you do the voice before they actually animate it. They animate it to your voice. Dubbing is when you dub over something that's already been voiced, like a lot of the anime that we consume. A lot of dubbing. It's Crunchyroll. They are non-union. They are work for hire. They don't hire a lot of talent who aren't in the actual location, right? Their whole thing is we want to make sure that we hire people who are here. My beliefs about that don't really matter. That's what they want. Okay, that's understood. Um, prelay animation you can do from anywhere. Not the point. Dub anime with your friends or voiceover for um, small once again, animation projects. What this does is it gets you practicing how to actually match lip flaps, how to actually practice timing. Dubbing is an art form. Dubbing is rather difficult, right? You need to know how to practice to get the emotional range that was there, but keep it fresh, but match the lip flaps and keep it within that time frame. That's a very difficult thing to do. You're putting a lot of your artistry in a small little box. So that's something you got to practice. Go and watch your favorite anime and practice voicing over or dubbing the lines, right? Get with a bunch of your friends and just practice dubbing the lines just for timing's sake, just for consistency's sake. Practice, practice, practice. That will already put you ahead of 90% of the people who want to do this as a career, who don't understand how difficult dubbing is. And last but not least, Video games. It's just about small, finding small indie projects and small indie teams. Now, know that there's not a, the IP or the concept, the design of the project. Reach out and say, hey, I love what you're doing. I'm a voice actor and I'd love to work with you. That's all that it takes. Just starting that conversation. And my mentor told me or taught me something valuable that I want to leave with you guys. Um, this will be the last bit of today. When you're cold outreaching, whether that be cold email, cold phone call, anything of that nature, your first initial contact isn't to start a conversation. It's to build intrigue so that they start a conversation. And then you can keep it going. So for example, if I were to cold email someone and it, it gives my life story just chunk, chunk, chunk. Hey, this is who I am. Hey, this is what I do. Hey, these are my credits. Hey, this is what I can do for you. Hey, this is why I want to be an actor. Hey, this, this, that, and the other. 95% of the time, a lot of people, hey, they have 500,000 DR. Too long, didn't read. So what you need to do and understand is that your first cold contact is to build intrigue so that they reach out to you. So it's simply, hey, love inspires curiosity. Because when they see it, they open the email. It's not a huge block of text with those bullet points. They see, oh, Disney? What is this? Oh, you've worked with Disney. Oh, uh, TLM 103, that's an industry standard microphone. Oh, that's your equipment. And then they ask a question. And then that's how you lead with conversation right? So just understand that that is one of the tips and tactics and techniques that I use to actually cold contact, cold email, cold phone call, actually connect with people because that is the important bit of this industry. And I'll leave you guys with this. Understand that as a voiceover artist, as a voice actor, as an actor, whatever you want to call yourself, we need to be putting artistry first because artistry is what actually gives us the motivation and what it, it gives us the drive and the ability to do our jobs it's what separates us from ai we have the emotional range to take life experiences and incorporate that inside of our art and that's what differentiates us from everybody else my voice might sound very similar to somebody else's voice and a lot of the time we just sit here and we worry, oh, well, we don't have a marketable, sellable voice because it sounds the same as A, B, C, and D. Well, I'm here to tell you, your voice sounds similar to 500,000 other people, right? You're doing something similar to 500,000 other people. I'm not flow. I'll use you, for example. A lot of the time you have a huge leg up, right? A lot of the time people are actually like producers and casting directors are looking for actors, screen actors, 
who are now transitioning to voice actors. Now, why is that? Because we want conversational. We want people who we can connect with. And as you know, as a screen actor, things need to be a little bit sloppy. You can't have things be perfect. Like voice actors learn and strive to have perfect diction. So if I'm saying iPhone 13, we would say crisp and perfectly, the iPhone 13. It's a perfect platform in order to create a life. They don't want that. Producers don't want that. And screen actors know how to do that. Screen actors, theater actors, they know how to mess it up a little bit to keep it alive. iPhone 13. It's a perfect platform in order to live your life, right? They know intuitively because that is a part of the training. So you will never be the same as anybody else. Your voice can sound similar, yeah, but you have a different flow, a different style, a different delivery. And that's the same with everybody. So use your life experiences, live your life, forget about the rules, make your own cake, and that way you can eat as much of it as you want, understand the realities of your life, rent before you commit so that you know if you actually want to do it. If I bought a place in California, I would not have any of these experiences, right? I left California to come back out to the Grand Canyon so that I can continue living these experiences so that I can put them into my work. And uh, last but not least, understand that we're all different. You're an artist. You know, you are different from everybody else. I was worried about how I sound too. You cover that. Yep. Don't worry about how you sound, right? There are plenty of people uh what's up Cato? hope that everything is good yeah we just went over um artistry and uh building your artistry into your voice over um and i'm still i'm still it's it's been very hectic i'm still working on listening through your demo i've got a bunch of notes that i'm going to send you don't worry about it i haven't forgotten about you i have not forgotten about you i'm going to be sending out those notes either today or tomorrow um but yeah, just know that everything, everybody's different. Like I was worried about my voice when I first got started. Everybody says that I had a marketable voice, like, because this is my voice right now, but I'm, I'm basically just sitting on my voice, but my voice is actually more so up here. My voice is very high and very active and very good for Nickelodeon and Disney and things like that. That's why I've worked with a lot of animation houses. Cause I sound more like a child until I sit my voice back. But, um, I worried for a very long time about my voice, how I sounded and if clients would like it and if I would be able to actually get work. I can sound like a kid, like a teenager, but I can't sound like a six-year-old. And that's okay, right? Just know your limitations and know that your voice is your voice. It is uniquely yours. And just understand that you are going to rock it. Oh, snap. Thanks, bro. I'm going to run this whole live back while I'm... <laughs> yep. I, I set this whole thing up like a podcast so that if you need, people can just listen to it in the background. They don't have to be here live, but I always love to have people so that we can answer, ask any questions that we might have. But um, as far as today, what time is it? Oh, shoot. It is 8.53. I got to go and get started with some auditions. Uh, It was great having this conversation with you, Cato. Thanks for coming in at the last second. Appreciate you, boss. Flo, it was wonderful to have this conversation with you. And um, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you guys in the next live stream. Peace out, everybody.